Good morning. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for our vocations. Help us to receive them more deeply. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Okay. So when I first wanted to be a deacon, I went to my wife and said, I think I want to be a deacon. And she said, a deacon? You're not even a good husband. <laughs> so that's called discernment. And of course she was right. Um, the foundation for those who are married uh, of the diaconate has to be your human capacity to be intimate with another human being, to go beyond the self, and to finally think about somebody else. My definition of marriage, when I first got marriage, married was, uh, I'll continue my bachelor life in the presence of a beautiful blonde roommate. She didn't like that definition. <laughs> so she went about trying to change that for the last 30-something years, and she's done a good job. So the woman humanizes us and matures us and tutors us, really, in, in how to love. And the internalization of the woman uh, happens the same as the internalization of God. I was at a wake a while ago, and I, I was at the casket, and the widow was standing by the casket. And she was standing there and she said, oh, Deacon Keating, she says, I cannot tell you how deeply he entered me. And she kept pointing to her heart. I cannot tell you how deeply he entered me. Obviously talking about her late husband. So the question is, how did he get in there? How did he get in there? How did he get internalized? in her heart, which is both a beautiful thing and a frightening thing. Beautiful in the sense that it's the true purpose of human life, is to finally have thought of someone so, uh, so other than you, that you are hospitable to their presence. And you're so hospitable that they actually enter your heart. There can't be anything more beautiful than that. But it's frightening too. Do I want to get that close? Do I want to reveal that much? Do I want to be that dependent? And of course, these are the questions we ask about God, too. I want to be close to God, but do I want to be that close? The closer I came to my wife, the more I changed, which is frightening. I always thought, you picture a scene, a bachelor trying to find a wife, and he's at the bar, and he's having a drink, and the door opens. This most beautiful woman that he's ever seen in his life walks in, and all of a sudden he notices that she's coming toward him at the bar. He's getting all excited. She's coming to me. She actually does. She comes, she sits down next to the person at the bar, grabs the stool right next to him, he says, hi, do you want a drink? She says, sure, but I want you to know something before you buy me that drink. I'm a woman. I'm here to kill you. That's their vocation. They're put on the planet to destroy our fat, relentless egos. And they're excellent at it. <laughs> they are superly well equipped to make us saints. If we cooperate, if we cooperate. And it doesn't matter what kind of woman it is. It could be your wife, it could be your mother, it could be your sister. They're all out to kill us. Especially your daughter. Your daughter's out to kill you. 
Your, da <laughs> your daughter's the biggest one. She's out to kill you. I remember I went home after I finished my doctorate, and I was all excited, and I achieved something, and I was very excited, so I went home to my parents to tell them, oh, I'm, I finished, I'm all excited, you know, and uh, go to my mother's house, and she's sitting at the table, uh, stirring a little cup of tea or something. I said, Mom, I'm done, I'm finished, uh, I finished my doctorate. Oh, Jimmy, that's great. Do you want bologna or salami for lunch? See, that doesn't matter. It's your wife, it's your mother. They're all after us. And that's why, to some extent, God is a woman. But that won't leave the room. Because they already have big enough heads as it is. I just told them they make us saints. Now I'm going to say that God's a woman. So it'll be a rough ride home. But to some extent, it's the same modus operandi, that the, closest, the closer you get to God, the more that ego dissipates, and the more frightening it becomes. You, you, know, you know in Scripture that the word fear is used a lot about God, fear of the Lord, because He's holy, He's other, He's different. And when He's done with us, we will not be the same. We will not be the same. And so people are afraid of that intimacy. And yet intimacy is salvific. It's what heals us. It's what brings us to fulfillment. And even though that poor widow by the casket was grieving, she had also reached the pinnacle and the fulfillment of human life. She had loved. And of course, because she had loved, she lost. And that's why a lot of people don't want to get close. If I get too close, I know it's going to end someday. I want to hold something back. I don't want to reveal too much. I, don't, I want to be in control. We're afraid of dying. But the whole movement since our baptism has been toward dying. After all, you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's our baptism. After all, you have died. Died to this world, to unruly desires, to the fat, relentless ego. We are dying to many, many things, and we are coming to life in in love. But it's a drama, and it's not determined. And of course, people want to expunge the existence of hell so that they can coast and ride life's wave without thought. But that's the recipe for boredom, emptiness. Life is a drama. Will he or will he not? Let the woman kill him. Let's watch and see. Will he or will he not let God kill him? Let's watch and see. Will he ever be so sick of himself as to finally think of another? Let's watch and see. And the most frightening thing about being human is that there are people who possibly have never gotten so sick of themselves. Motivated by fear, motivated by greed, motivated by some type of self-love, disordered self-love. They never took that step to become the widow by the casket and let someone finally affect them. To be affected by the presence of another. That is one of the moral pinnacles of being human. The body of Christ. Amen.
the blood of Christ. Amen. Do we let that mystery in? Do we let it affect us? Is it routinized? Or is it something that we prepare for when we go to Mass? And seek to be vulnerable in His coming. Let's hope so. Because every Mass is salvation being offered once again. Every Mass is ordered toward changing us to finally think of someone other than ourselves. I remember when I met Marianne, I dated her for a while, went home to my parents and I said, I think I'm going to marry Marianne. And they said, we knew that. So you never treated any human the way you treated her. We knew that. You never treated any human the way you treated her. They could have said, we knew that because you were finally affected by the presence. You finally saw and beheld the beauty of another. And it has changed you. That's salvation. To behold, to contemplate the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus so deeply that it etches its mark in our soul. And we cannot forget him. And we begin to think differently and choose differently. When you fall in love with a woman, you move from that bachelor mind to a spousal mind. Something you would never thought you would ever inhabit. A spousal mind. From the time you were born to the time you go through the awkward teenage years of being a boy, the ego has inflated so much that it surprises you when she enters, you are shocked because you're so filled with yourself. You're unconscious to the fact that someday another may fill that space. This is the beginning of salvation. You know, since we're born, we're all turned in on ourselves. St. Bonaventure called it in curvatus se. We are turned in until something beautiful turns us out. We are naturally self-centered. Just to remember this, you remember when you were a teenage boy and on a Saturday you'd, you'd get up, you know, 8 a.m., you'd jump out of bed with joy. Remember those days? And then you'd find your dad and you'd say this marvelous sentence. Dad, good morning. How can I help you today? <laughs> Remember those days? Right? And people don't think we need a savior. We're a mess. If there was one deacon in this room who actually did that on a Saturday, we would have beat the crap out of him. <laughs> because he would have been experienced as weird. Right? That's where we get martyrs from. <laughs> a martyr is just a holy person in the midst of normally self-involved men. That's all. And we can't stand him because he's so unlike us that we have to get rid of him. God's trying to get rid of that man. After all, you have died and your life is now hidden. Your wife's been trying to get rid of that man. Your father, your mother's been trying to get rid of that man. Get rid of that man. 
And the way we do that daily is the Eucharist. Day in and, and day out. Blessed Don Marmion once said that the Eucharist is the seed of immortality. The seed of immortality. The more you receive the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the more you are securing eternal life in your body. In your body. If you are fully vulnerable, if you want to be affected by it. Now, we all know we can go to Mass and just go home. We all know we can go to Mass and not really be present. We all know that presence is willed. My mother and father had seven kids. My dad had three jobs because he had seven kids. But that still didn't, you know, make my mother joyful every time he went out to his third job. She got angry. You're never home. When he'd come home, they'd have a fight. You're never home. He'd say, I'm home now. I'm here now. And she would say, that chair is here now too. And are you really here? Or are you the chair? Are you really engaging my presence? The engagement of the presence is the way to participate in the Eucharist. Part of the ritual is the problem. Part of the ritual is the answer. The part that's a problem is it's a ritual. We get used to it. Second nature. But that's the beauty of it too. The beauty of it is that I don't have to pay as t much attention to the superficial waves. I know what to do. I know how to pray the Mass. So I can go under it. I can go in it. It's going to run. I don't have to run it anymore. I can go in. And the more I pay attention and the more I'm vulnerable, the more I'm going to gather the fruit of that deeper contemplation of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Pope Benedict XVI said, once our deepest participation in the Mass is silence. Silence bespeaks the process of internalization going on. That union is happening. In America, silence means rejection, loneliness, isolation. In the mystical world, it means complete communion. Complete communion. We know all the jokes about all of us old people in our marriages about the silence that overcomes marriage. I remember my brother and I, when we were jerky little kids, we'd go to a diner. I was raised in New York, so you have a diner. We'd go there every Saturday. We'd sit in the same booth and get a chocolate milkshake. But we sat in the same booth because the old bag and his wife sat in the booth next to us. And we made fun of them. And they'd come in and we'd say, here they go. And Mona would say, Frank, what do you want? Frank says, you know what I want. I'm going to have the soup. Frank says to Mona, Mona, what do you want? You know what I want. I'm going to have the cottage cheese. And my brother and I would be mouthing this script <laughs> in the booth next to them. Same damn thing every Saturday. First of all, my brother said to me, kill me before I ever like cottage cheese. 
That's not a normal attraction. That's learned behavior, or that's a wound that's trying to be healed. Something horrible happened to you if you choose cottage cheese. That almost means you're qualified for the nursing home. Reject the cottage cheese. Stay with the steak. And then they'd fall into silence. And this is when I told my brother, kill me before I never have anything to say to my girlfriend. And of course, silence can mean they hate each other. It could mean alienation. But again, the mystic silence is, we're one. We're one. Not we're alone. We're so one. We are communicating in our oneness. That's all. I say now about my marriage, I say, are you home? No, I'm never home unless I'm with Mary Ann. Home is wherever Mary Ann is. That's home. This becomes the beginning of what the saints call holy indifference. It doesn't matter where you are, as long as you're with the one you've internalized. Your own. That's home. My favorite saint, Blessed Father Solanus Casey, he got transferred a lot because old ladies kept coming and bugging him. And his friar, his brother friars had to protect him. Because once you get an old lady, you know, retinue, they won't let you go. Once old ladies know you're a saint, forget it. You'll never have a day's peace. They'll be coming again and again and again. So this poor guy, wherever he was assigned, he had old ladies out the door. There's a great YouTube about Padre Pio. Look it up one day. And it's Padre Pio, it's a really ancient kind of video. It must have been 1940s or 50s. Black and white, coming down the hallway of his friary. Friar leads him out, opens the door. Out the door are all the Italian ladies waiting for him. He takes his cord on his habit and starts beating them. <laughs> Ladies, leave the saints alone. <laughs> this, is, this is very dangerous for their spiritual life. They're going to have to confess anger. So poor Father Solanus was transferred all the time. And he only said one thing when he was transferred. Solanus, you're going to go to Huntington, Indiana. Is God there? How beautiful. Doesn't matter. Is the one I love there? Yes, we think God's in Huntington, Indiana. Oh, then I'll go. Frank, you're going to die. Is God there? Yes, since the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God is inside death. Yes, he's there. You can go there. The internalization through the choosing to be present is absolutely vital for our participation in all sorts and levels of love. And when we attain that, we fall into silence because we are full, not because we are empty. You cannot have union without silence. This is the thing, if you have good relationships with your priest, tell them to shut up for a minute in two places, after the homily and after we receive Holy Communion. After the homily, they rush back to the chair and start the creed. Sit down and shut up. The word has just gone out. And I cannot internalize it unless it's conveyed in silence. Sit down. 
And the second place is after Holy Communion. And not why the communion song is going on and all that stuff. I mean dead silence. Well, I, I, you know, I purified the vessels. That's enough time. These people want to go to Target. Let's get them home. <laughs> and then the priest gets nervous. We're going to get mad. The Mass is too long. You want the Mass shorter? Have a shorter homily. But don't, don't chip us silence. All healing in the Mass is in the silence. No silence, no healing. And silence is essential for communion. When I was uh, engaged to Marianne, we were sitting on the couch one night and uh, she's talking, blah, 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 blah. And I'm looking at her, I'm saying, you are beautiful. Would you just Shut up, because I want to kiss you. I didn't say that out loud, but I was thinking. <laughs> Would you just shut up? Blah, 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 blah. So I just said to her, hey, Mayor, can I kiss you? And she said, sure. So I did. Now, before the kiss was executed and consented to and consummated, we went through an amazing territory. And the territory is silence. You cannot kiss a talking woman. <laughs> Try it. Before the kiss comes to its consummation, even if it's a millisecond, she is going to have to stop talking. Because what precedes union and what conveys union, silence. And so it is with our Lord and the Mass. And we have to get this message out more and more, especially during this renewal of the Eucharist that the church is going through, that those two areas of the Mass are not marginal. But we also must catechize the people what to do with that silence, because they do not know. If a priest springs silence on the congregation, they think he had a heart attack in the chair. They don't know what's going on. Why is he sitting up there? Is he all right? Fred, go up and shake him. <laughs> it's like everyone thinks the poor guy's sleeping or dead. No, folks, this is part of the Eucharist. Because when you receive a mystery as great as God, you must receive it in such a way that it silences you unto communion. Whether it's the word, or whether it's the body. The full Christ is being received in silence. So during Advent or during Lent, take some initiative in your parish to consider a catechesis on the silence of the Mass and take your priest aside and ask him to be more generous in this area. In the parishes that do this, the people begin to pant after the silence. You think they're going to be mad? You think this is a waste of time? No. They finally begin to settle and rest into the receptivity of divine love. And then the mass becomes what it's supposed to be. A place of reciprocal love. The bridegroom loving the bride, and the bride giving love back to the bridegroom. It is a place of reciprocity, communion, communication. If we let it happen, if we are really present, if we are vulnerable, when the word is preached, announced, 
then the body is given. If, then salvation will have been offered not in vain. But we all need to learn this vulnerability in Eucharistic praying. And this culture particularly is very impatient with intimacy. Our standard is immediate gratification. I want it, and I want it now. And we've been tutored on that through the computer, through fast food, through lots of things, where everything is delivered immediately, or we get frustrated. God will not pander to this American weakness. He will come in the way that he has come, when he has come, for all of human history. And it will not be dependent on our vices. The Mass is boring. No, you're boring. Because you're rebelling against the ascetical feature of the Mass. What is the ascetical feature of the Mass? It is the only hour not about you. And that's why the pews are empty. Because God will not pander. And he's not afraid. Oh, here come the Americans. I better do a tap dance for them. Priests are afraid. God is not. And you can only manipulate the Mass so much to reduce it to an extension of the American need for immediate gratification before it no longer becomes the Mass and becomes a sacrilege. But God will hold that back. And the saints among us will hold that back because the simplicity of the Mass is the simplicity of the Mass. The body of Christ, amen. The blood of Christ, amen. Hey, all you're getting here is God. That's it. No show. No tingling of the emotions. You're just getting God. And I don't know why God doesn't give us ecstasies when we receive his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Maybe because he knew that America was going to be on the planet. And he didn't want to buy into that cause and effect. No, just sit there and love me. And just sit there and be loved. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like those people in the diner booth. Hey, guess what, Mona? All you're getting is me for 50 years. That's all. Nothing exciting, nothing jazzy. Same guy, same body, same dumb jokes, same endless talking about how bad work is. That's all you're getting, 50 years of him. That's all. What are you getting? A person. All you're getting at the mass, a person. Is that not good enough for you, America? Of course it's not. We're the ones who have a nuclear explosion at the NFL halftime show. Because everything bores us. And everything must titillate my emotions. And my famous American question is always, what's new? What's next? What's novel? What's new? What's next? 
we can't just stay in communion. We must always be looking at the door. Who's coming? Who's next? What's new? And Jesus won't play that game. So we have to tutor people in what? How to participate in a ritual? No. How to finally start loving outside of yourself. Very, very difficult. Which is why we need the Savior. Because psychology is not going to get us there. And getting a degree to college won't get us there. The only one who's going to turn our insides out is love itself, God, the person of God, if we finally let him affect us, which is crucial. There's an old couple up in North Dakota. Anybody here from North Dakota before I insult it? So they were from Bismarck, and it was Sunday, and they didn't have anything to do. It's Bismarck. So they'd go for a ride. They'd go for a ride outside. And when you get outside of Bismarck, there's even less. So they'd ride around in the car on Sunday and go for their Sunday ride. And it was a stick shift. And the husband would drive, and he'd change the gears. And he was telling me once his wife laid her hand on his hand, on the stick ship. That's all. She just laid her hand on his hand, on the stick ship. And he said, you know, I received that hand as the deepest of presences. subtle but he didn't miss it in silence we can pick up God's modus operandi of loving us subtle he is the master of subtlety and if you're a bull in the china shop you will think God does not exist. And you will think he has no message for you. But it's only because you're stupid. <laughs> now, not once in the history of my married life did Marianne ever come to the dining room table naked. Not once. Now, if she came to the dining room table naked, I would probably say something like this, because I'm a smart guy. Perhaps she's feeling amorous. See, I would get that message. But she never did that. She didn't play into my stupidity, because she was still trying to tutor me to what it means to be human. And so she would come to the table with just the one extra button not done. And perfume. And I would say, this is damn good meatloaf. So that night, I watched the NFL. That's how night, that my night ended, because I was stupid. God is the same way. God's the same way. We have to slow down, be silent. We receive in ways that perhaps we've never received before or we will miss 
what is a nearly constant stream of communication at the level of subtlety and constant presence. It's overwhelming. And when you read about the saints, you'll see this incarnated, that their prayer lives become overwhelmed, almost to the point of screaming out, Stop, Jesus! Stop loving me so much! Whereas other people on the planet are looking for him, the ones who learn the substance of silence and subtlety, they're overwhelmed. And they cannot take as much love as he's giving. So let's be in silence just for a minute, and then we'll take a break. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, come to us now and remain with us forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, if we can take a break till maybe a little before 10.30. Thank you.